Get Westminster and Whitehall out of the business of setting national exams. This is intrinsically corrupt. This is an opportunity for them to learn more and knowledge is power. Everybody here seems to have one accord in that it's, it's not the answer that's the same, it's the fact that the destiny of children for tomorrow is in the hands of the teaching profession. an occasion where teachers can come together in an act of celebration. Well, I don't know many teachers for whom kids aren't like the centre of what they do anyway. Why are we just looking at the English and mathematics? Why is there not a broader focus? Why are schools not invited to be able to be creative, to be able to develop their people as students, to be able to develop them as random individuals? Of course, be excited about the future. Some people will think you are balmy for being here today. They'll think you're off your head. If they want you to what on a Saturday, no thanks. Just talk a little bit about how this day started. This day was created with me on Twitter having a bit of a moan about the fact that education events always <coughs> seem to happen in London. Messaging Deborah, Deborah messaging me, a glass of wine in both houses, and us saying, yeah, of course we can do one in, in the north to rival anything that happens in London. She sends a tweet out to everyone saying, be them, we're looking at doing something in the north, who's interested? Twitter lit up and Norman Rocks was born, sort of almost overnight. When this question says the DfE talks down teachers, and the unions talk down the DfE, I don't agree with the balance of that question because I think there's a reality to the, to the, uh, the way the DfE is damaging teachers. So the fact that we are not trusted as primary school teachers to decide how we assess reading, to decide how you teach reading, to decide the structure of a literacy or a numeracy lesson, these things are all real. They're not just talking down. The, the, the lack of trust in teachers is profound and we have to find ways to overcome that. It's not just, you know, the unions attacking the DfE and Ofsted and everybody attacking the unions and attacking the profession. I think we've been attacking education per se in this country for far too long. And I think when we look at things like PISA rankings and the way in which they're portrayed in the paper and we're actually um, trying to compare the output of our education system with city-states like Singapore and Macau, I just think it makes the whole thing grossly unfair. And I would like to see for a change, um, instead of trying to create chaos from which change will automatically progress, let's have some evidence-based policy. Let's actually look at what is happening around the world and learn from it rather than just using glib examples and saying, oh, you know, we're, we're, going, to, we're going to follow the example of, of Finland. There's an overall argument about the nature of the education system. Is the answer to keep asking politicians and white people to solve all the problems, or is it actually genuine decentralisation? My experience of white and Westminster system is that it is fundamentally broken. Do you think that going from a highly centralised system to almost an archaic um, freedom, in which every school is free to make their own choices, is a bit frightening? Especially when you have such a high level of surveillance within the system, you are stirred in other structures. The system's become so fragmented mm. that schools are finding it very difficult to connect and communicate with each other, which I think is why we end up with events like this. It, it seems to me that you came in and kind of said all these things and threw them out, but didn't take away the accountability structures that are mm. making us fearful in the first place. Well, I think as a civil war, I said um, right at the very beginning that I, I, I fundamentally agree with um, Ofsted. I think Ofsted, Ofsted has very profound problems. Um, I think somewhere around here, Robert Coe is here. Robert Coe has written about, about, um, about this problem. I hope that Ofsted take this very seriously. Ofsted is clearly a major problem with how the whole system operates and it needs fundamental change. So I, I, I agree with that. Um, Ofsted is a blight on the system, has been for years and it's causing more problems than it's solving. Uh, any organisation that needs seven new frameworks in ten years can't be strategically certain. And if you had that many changes of policy, you'd probably do in special measures. I could do myself in uh, a lot of work uh, very quickly, but I know I'm limited to time. The
problem, I think, is that schools, particularly the leadership of schools and the governance of schools, respond to being talked down to and then start to justify themselves in the terms of the DfE on Ofsted. So consequently, after inspections, you see signs outside of schools saying, Ofsted says we're good. So you're immediately dancing to their tune. It doesn't very often say, Ofsted says we're good, but what do they know? <laughs> I saw them the other day and said, Ofsted said we're good, but our children think we're smashing, which I thought was quite clever. <laughs> uh, but we must stop dancing to the tune and start having proper professional arguments. Okay, we're looking at successful countries, and Mr. Gove has mentioned Finland, although he doesn't mention it anymore, um, because we, can't, we won't have a system like Finland ever. Um, Finland actually is, education in Finland is run by, pretty much by consensus politics. So 30 or so years ago, Finland decided what it needed out of its education system to make sure that it had a properly skilled workforce, that its children were leaving school literate and numerate and all the rest of it. We are never going to have that in this country. While every four years we have a change of government, a change of secretary of state, who brings their own political ideology, to the role. But, um, Dominic actually put his finger on it when he was saying that you, you need to move more things, more control out of Whitehall and, and, and Westminster and, to, and hopefully hand it over to um, you know, world class professionals. But the trouble is, no government has ever done that actually. Um, I would say both the present government and um, the previous Labour government actually had their hands on the control of very much so. And there's a sort of, there's a slight dichotomy sometimes, I think, in the way that um, ministers talk about education. About this. There is substantial international evidence that more autonomy leads to higher standards, but it's particular sorts of autonomy. It's autonomy for teachers in classrooms about how you teach and how you assess. That's good autonomy. And we aren't getting that from what, what Michael Gove <coughs> and Dominic are doing. Academies aren't getting that. You don't escape from league tables by getting to be an academy. You don't escape from Ofsted by getting to be an academy. So people don't get those freedoms. The autonomy Dominic's talking about is the privatisation autonomy. So he says that we are... He, said, he says he wants to free up schools to decide how they pay, but actually only if they have a performance-related pay system that schools don't want. It seems to me that over the past year, the, the language that has been used to describe Ofsted and to view Ofsted has shifted dramatically. And I, as a teacher, you would think I would be punching the air with glee at the prospect that Ofsted might be on its way out. But I fear what it's going to be replaced with. I fear that schools will be judged purely on results, purely on data, and that we'll be driving children ever more through a narrow set of measurements that actually limits their growth. Um, so perhaps it would be worth us all having a little comment on what life without Ofsted might actually be like. In terms of Ofsted, um, my, I, don't, I, I don't know what my answer is to this. I, because it's politically undoable, I didn't spend a lot of time thinking about it. I would go and strip the whole thing like that. And my own approach to it, uh, unthought out, would be maximum, maximum simplicity. What is the definition of failure? And then, uh, what kind of organisation do you need to monitor that definition of failure? And apart from that, I would basically just let, let it go. I would uh, give parents much more, I would make schools much more accountable to parents, not to Westminster. And apart from that minimal failure regime for whatever replaces Ofsted, I would just take, take my hands off it. Richard's question about what replaces Ofsted is a, it's a question fraught with difficulties because we absolutely must not go anywhere near saying that we don't want to be accountable. Clearly, I mean, there's the financial thing, we, we're spending billions of money, but we're also responsible for the children's education. We have to be accountable in a very serious way for how that happens. But what we've got at the moment is this low trust, high accountability model, and we need to have a high trust, high accountability model. We need some principles of accountability, that it should always be based on professional dialogue, high quality professional dialogue, and it should always be proportionate. I would like to see an offset which um, Kevin described a, a critical friend. Um, I suppose that, that's quite a good term for it. But an offset where 
um, they go in, they take a look at what's going on, they do some sort of evaluation and tell you what's going wrong. What isn't so good, what you need to improve on, how that improvement should be made. And then periodically check up to make sure that you're achieving those levels. Um, I, don't, I don't see Offset at all having any sort of political um, influence in the way it appears to have at the moment. I think that's a hugely dangerous situation that Offset has got itself in. Yet the recent workload survey figures carried out by the government show that teachers' working time has gone up by 10 hours on Michael Gove's watch. And that what other surveys show is that that extra time is being spent on things that they teachers tell us do not benefit children in the classroom, that they have no impact on their learning. It's doing these accountability things. So my question is, what's gone wrong and how do we address that? Well, I, think, I think what's gone wrong is this notion that everything's, um, everything's up to you uh, and the system's stopping you blossoming when actually we only measure a little bit of the flower. So consequently, the number of children doing dance, drama, music, art, PE, design technology is reducing uh, at a time when we're supposed to be able to do whatever we want. Now, I can't believe that children don't want to do those things. And that's because of the uh, very, very clever pressures that are put on. Uh, you talk about teachers, and a lot of head teachers you feel that they spend their time gathering data to give to somebody who's asking for it, rather than improving the teaching in their school. And it, it's just simply that we're dancing to the tune instead of uh, controlling the tune. Okay. We have a combination of more resources with um, genuinely empowering teachers and teachers taking responsibility for weeding out the relatively small number of people who are not strong for teaching and doing a bad job, then I think the whole status of fashion and the whole debate will completely change. Um, and just, just coming back on that at the moment, that you talk about the relatively small number of people who aren't doing a very good job. My, my main concern at the moment are the excellent teachers who are fleeing the profession, um, myself included. Can you just come back on that? I know I'm interrupting you, but it's my conference stuff. <laughs> I think that I think that is a problem. I think I guess it's partly financial, it's partly offset, which we've talked about, and, 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 um, and, 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 and probably um, don't need to go into any more. I mean, we have done a lot of things. You know, we put an awful lot of money into bursaries to, to try and attract people, particularly into maths and science things. So there's a lot of things that that we've done. Um, I think that is a problem, but I think it, a lot will depend on on the election. My fear about the election is. And everyone in Westminster pretty much signs up to a, 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 a very similar conventional wisdom. I don't think the Oxford issue is likely to be tackled. I don't think a lot of the really fundamental problems like the use of GCSEs and accountability will, will, be, will be handled. And um, I also don't think that education is a priority for any of the three political leaders. I think teachers collectively need a metaphor of cuddle. Um, you know, and I think, I think that teachers collectively need to be offered some hope that in the future that the profession will be uh, trusted to self-improve. Um, I think we do need though, to put some safeguards in place so that teachers in their places of work can expect a right to continue professional development so that they can uh, continue to, to learn and to um, progress their own careers and where necessary to avoid burnout because I think Teacher training and, and looking after the, and safeguarding teachers is an expensive business and they are an expensive resource to be cast to one side. So we need to be thinking much more laterally about things like putting in place opportunities for career breaks so that uh, teachers can actually refresh themselves. Um, but when I was in the States with a select committee a few months ago, um, I couldn't help but be negatively impressed by the model on which some of the charter schools were working. And these were charter schools working in tough neighborhoods. But the principal in two of the, the principals in two of the schools that we met uh, had a clear view that the vast majority of teachers that they currently had would be burnt out within five years. Now that's fine about, in terms of in, uh, turning an individual school in a neighborhood round. But in terms of an overall model for improving education outcomes for millions of children, it's completely unsustainable. 
and therefore we've got to think about public policy about how it's going to impact on all the kids everywhere and all the teachers everywhere and having a business model which sees 80% of your teachers being burnt out within five years is completely bonkers. <laughs> Our children. Stop testing them at five, stop testing them at seven, stop testing them at eleven. And then we're going to have to get them in school and they get better results. Yeah, I just respond to the first bit that lady over there said about testing children. I think we uh, have got to get parents particularly to understand that actually uh, we're sanitising it, calling it assessment. It's really testing. And in truth, we're not even testing their children, we're doing proper control on the classroom and the school. And it's like watching what has been passed to the uh, on, Generally, actually, I, on, on testing, um, I would agree. I mean, I've talked to um, quite a few people who say that, uh, people in, in further education, people in universities, who say that when students come to them, they actually are not at the level that their qualifications say they are because they've been coached for the exams, they've been coached for the tests, and they lack some of the basic understanding that they need in their studies. But I think something which really, um, I think, hounded the last government was that all too often, the people at the top under the last government had too much of a utilitarian attitude towards education. You know, the English and maths thing, and science thing, it was all about, from their perspective, <coughs> making sure that we were producing adequate units for the labour market, rather than well-rounded human beings. And I, I, I still think education should be about helping young people to develop into well-rounded human beings, not just units for the labour market. Now, they've got to be able to work, they've got to be able to thrive, but they've also got to be able to understand the world that they live in and thrive within that, within that context. It worries me that politicians of all parties seem to think that schools alone and teachers alone can overcome the effects of poverty. And I'd just say to Michael Gove, who said, we're speaking today, saying that teachers are holding back working class children. And I say, Michael Gove, you are part of a government that got rid of educational maintenance allowance. You've trebled the tuition fees. You've lent the bedroom tax, which means kids have been forced out of school. This is the biggest attack on working class aspiration for generations. So Michael Gove has got a responsibility along with other politicians to seek to do something about poverty and not to blame us for the effects of poverty in our schools. Hospitals don't get blamed for the fact that working class people have lower health outcomes than middle class people, but somehow schools do and we have to stop that. morning session I think was just an indication of how big and difficult a beast education is to grapple with uh, and I got the impression that uh, Dominic Cummins especially was pretty uh, annoyed at his time in Whitehall um, and a lot of the things I said I, he said I, I think well yeah that's all right but it, it's not that workable but I, I guess that's his point um, so yeah a lot to think about said about Northern Rocks reclaiming pedagogy and uh, having lived in London for three years there's a lot of events down in London, down in the south but there's not a thing up here so it's great that uh, the organisers have got something going at this scale. Debbie and Emma set this up really as an as a opportunity, I think, for all teachers from every sector they are in education to get together and talk about it, teaching and learning. And it hasn't, couldn't be better. It seems to be a fantastic you know, um, buzz around the place, everybody's talking and asking questions and thinking about you know, stuff with education, so that's great.
about trying to prove the impact that the art and creativity can have on standards and on attainment, as well as enriching the students' lives and, 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 and as we heard in the debate this morning, creating that rounded individual. And the, I think there was a consensus that change needs to happen, but be more driven by the teaching profession than the politicians. So I thought that came across quite well. It's about the individual and what you can do, because you can't go back to school Monday and change the system of your school. You likely can't go back to school Monday and get your head to do anything different. Um, and that can be really frustrating. But on Monday, you can go back and you can change small things in your classroom. And even that will be really hard and difficult. But that is something you can do. And it's basically you noticing things in your classroom, changing something, and having a look at what that change, what effect that change has. Uh, so when you get a group of teachers like this who are really keen to learn about that stuff and give up a Saturday, it's, it's a great opportunity. He said it's easier to find teachers that can act than it is to find actors that can teach. And it was that facilitation, that expertise that he took fast, that was a very sort of mutually beneficial. Should you, should you immediately whip into a sanction situation because somebody has had a reptilian response to being put under unreasonable pressure in the classroom situation? I don't need an answer, I'm just going to find out some questions. Then. That's the fifth F. <laughs> so we have our teacher eye, but we only have our teacher eye in many cases for is the class going to kick off or not? Do I need to move on to the next thing or not? And actually, we need to get better at looking at individual student needs. I'll tell you what I use that for. I use that when I'm in it, when I'm teaching, when I'm working with children and we're in the moment with children. We're in the classroom. We're, the planning's gone because we're in it. And that's where that's in my head. I'm looking around and I'm finding out where the kids are and where I need to intervene appropriately. Right. I think my job as a head teacher is to get the conditions of, for growth right. I've started experimenting with solo taxonomy in my own lessons and I wanted to hear from some experts who've got a little bit more experience than me on how they're doing and to discuss with other people what they've been doing and to learn from their mistakes and experiences too. And we do know there's a disparity between what the feeder schools are saying they're leaving with and what they're right with. That is not just that they're ambitious or exaggerating. Two other things are playing into that, like the summer holidays and they're going to a new setting. This is all of the schools of the 53 that returned figures on this in the first census. These are the ones who had more than 20% of their staff um, without QTS and many of them not on QTS routes, although not all. It was interesting to me, I did a quick check, none of these has currently been given an outstanding. If you try and observe a whole group, you will miss so much that it's meaningless. Before we slice this poem to pieces, let's just enjoy it for its beauty and for what it is.
shouldn't be um, judging individual lessons and giving them a quality rating is firstly, no one has yet devised a method of, of doing that satisfactorily on the basis of a single lesson. That, you know, this is in the blog here, you need at least six observations, for example, by two independent observers who've been trained for two days to get a satisfactory rating of a teacher's quality. So if you've got less than that, you, you know, you're into the flaky stuff. sessions I've attended um, have been really very informative and it's also an opportunity to meet lots of people that I've been in contact with for uh, a, a very long time but actually never met in person so that's a fantastic opportunity to, to, to do so. However, secondly, why, why, why are we still banning phones because the phones in their pockets, let's be honest, are probably more powerful than the computers and the desktops. So then you're left with accountability and accountability is the lever that gets pulled the most because it's the easiest one to pull, it doesn't cost very much from the point of view of government, um, and it's, uh, it is very effective. Yeah. Yeah. If that's not an incentive to get out of bed in the morning, I'm not sure what is. I mean, I think it's very interesting from the panel discussions and from later on that this is all about, and the whole event is all about, it's coming from teachers. Successful learning and development takes time. So I think the most important thing about it, being here today is that it was in the north, so it's been really nice to be surrounded by northern people, talking a little bit when we could about specific issues to do with the north, that's been really important to me. And uh, also just having lots of different people give up their Saturday, bring their passion, their energy here. And what that means is you get this dynamic type of conversation about policy problems, what we're doing in the classroom, can we do research better, and it's just really helped us all come together and think a bit more about education. Ten telltale signs that you are a good teacher. Number one, you get very excited in stationery shops. <laughs> Do you know the story Chicken Licking, Goosey Lucy, Henny Penny, Foxy Loxy? Number two, you enjoy Friday nights and Saturday nights. And basically, these creatures chase each other around in a circle, each chasing the other. And they realise they're going around in circles and will never get to anywhere but chasing each other. That's all that's happening. Number three, you think very carefully about your hairstyle. <laughs> they just don't know how the story will stop. And so the last page of the story is that Henny Penny was chased by Chicken Licking, by Foxy Loxy, Goosey Lucy, every one of the things going around in a circle. Number four, being paid overtime is an alien concept. <laughs> and then the sky fell in. Number five, you can actually talk to children. And I think over the last few years we've been so busy chasing the next little result, the league table, the Ofsted, the PISA results, the new qualifications, the new curriculum, it doesn't matter what it is, we just keep chasing. And in the end, the sky will fall in, basically. Number six, your car boot resembles a stock cupboard. <laughs> We've reached a point now where there are lots of questions about whether the education system is fit for purpose because it's doing too many narrow things and not enough big things. Number seven, You've got metaphorical wing mirrors attached to your head so that you can look back, reflect, learn and be a better teacher. Thanks. <laughs> That's my favourite. <laughs> Most of your schools have got lovely strap lines or um, mission statements or visions. You know, you drive past and in the, on, the, on, the, on the sign it says something like, towards infinity <laughs> or beyond infinity somebody went the other week I don't know I think they'll be back but they went beyond infinity or to infinity and beyond number eight you are confident in what you do in spite of everything and what we keep doing in the education system is is moving the system on a bit because everybody else is calling the tune when actually what we really want for our children, it typically in our mission statements and our logos and our strap lines, it has something about a fulfilling life and the common good. And children achieving things for themselves that will equip them for a life beyond school. Number nine, you're happy to take some risks. And number ten, 
you ask for glove puppets for Christmas. <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit worried if we, what if we, what if we don't do so well? Well, if you don't do so well, then you get downgraded, I'm afraid. It does say, you, if you've got a sign-up that says we're outstanding, I'm afraid that would have to go. I mean, what is the name of your school? It's uh, King Edward. Where is it? Uh, we're in Great Yarmouth. Oh, well, they, they would downgrade you if you didn't do very well. You would uh, be reduced from King to Prince, <laughs> Prince Edward, and Great Yarmouth would go down to um, just simply Good Yarmouth. It, <laughs> it would have to change. <laughs> Right, well, I think that'll do then. <laughs> you know, we've got a plan, and you've got to make progress within the next 14 minutes, and we've got to observe it. Always look on the bright side of school. Always look on the bright side. <laughs> Just one thing that wrecks it is when you are inspected. Try to teach your lessons with a sing. Get them seated quickly and make the engine just slip. <laughs> right, write down some objectives, that's the thing. And always... The chances are that quite a lot of people in this room come from a so-called outstanding school. And once you're in a so-called outstanding school, it's amazing how you don't criticise the system too much, too loudly because they might come back. Once you've got the wolf away from your door, you don't need them round again. But I have to tell you, um, you might be in a so-called outstanding school, good for you, and I, I think it's great for you. Absolutely. But the only consistent thing about Ofsted inspection is that it's inconsistent. And the foot soldiers that go around doing it do not apply a consistent process. It is a negotiation between the lead inspector and the head teacher based on the assertiveness of each party. An assertive lead inspector and a less assertive head has a different outcome from an assertive head teacher and a less assertive uh, lead inspector. And that is just the fact. And the, you can watch people in this system suffering the consequences of inconsistent inspection. Not only that, it takes uh, what seemed to be a logical process of investigating something called teaching and it turns it into a very personal progress, process where teaching comes out as teacher. What conversations are you going to have? Who do you need to talk to on Monday? What happens when you leave? What do you want your legacy to be at the school you are at? Just here early, just before we started, a lady came up to, to Mick and said, you were, you were the primary head teacher of my school. I don't remember, but my mum and dad said I had to come and say hello. And I find that quite moving. So what's your legacy? What do you want your legacy to be at your school? How do you want the children to talk about you? How do you want your colleagues? How do you want your TA to talk about you? To my class. Many people will walk into and out of your life, but only true friends leave footprints in your heart. To handle yourself, you need to use your head, but to, un to handle others, it's your heart that matters. Anger is just one letter short of danger. The tongue weighs practically nothing, but so few people can hold it. If someone betrays you once, it's usually his fault. If he betrays you twice, it's usually your fault. Great minds discuss ideas, average minds discuss events, small minds tend to discuss people. God gives every bird its food, but he doesn't throw it into the nest. He who loses money loses much, he who loses a friend loses more, he who loses belief and spirit loses everything. Beautiful young people are acts of nature, beautiful old people are works of art. We can learn from the mistakes of others, but we can't live long enough to make all the mistakes ourselves. Friends, you and me, you brought another friend and then there were three. We started a group, our circle of friends. Like that circle, there should be no beginning and should be no end.
I think today's been a fantastic experience, and really putting back the uh, pedagogy in the hands of the, of the teachers. Uh, I think that's come through from everything we've seen today in terms of teachers can impact uh, outcomes in their own classroom by their own research and giving the power back to the teachers. <laughs> Um, I think it's been an absolutely wonderful day and the reason it's been brilliant today is because it's like-minded people, no matter what their qualifications, we've got trainee teachers, we've got head teachers, we've got school leaders, federation leaders, they've all been here and they've been talking about the importance of classroom practice, their own learning and uh, what they offer, the offer we have for our children in our schools, so it's just been magic. But something still remains. I'm Andy Neil. I came today as Global Solo to help do a presentation on Solo Taxonomy. Our workshop was full, we could have had more in there, and it was fantastic. I still care. I still care. And for me, it was the tagline, it was reclaiming pedagogy. And I, there's been a lot of talk about things like Ofsted, etc. But really, it's about what teachers do in classrooms, and you can often just ignore all of that big national stuff. And you can get on with it, and you can make a real positive difference. We should, I think we've empowered a lot of teachers to actually say, no, I don't, I don't agree with this, and I'm going to challenge this. But also, just giving them a an opportunity to feel good about being, te being teachers because I think so many times teachers feel sort of browbeaten and <laughs> look a bit downtrodden and, and I think Deb was absolutely right this was not about that this was about celebrating and saying that you're all, you're all fantastic and we're all here together to celebrate teaching and uh, build on that yeah. and not to, not to just be saying aren't we all wonderful but to be saying what can we do to improve what can we do to be better? What can we do to stop colluding in a system that is effectively damaging children at this moment in time? And to recognise that the answer lies with us and not with policy makers, not with Ofsted inspectors, not with LEA advisors. What you do in your classroom, that pedagogical activism that takes part in your classroom, is the grassroots answer to education's problems. Turn back the tide on our 